record this meeting. There we go. That's excellent. Uh, so for everybody here, this meeting will be recorded. For everybody that signed up and wasn't here, this meeting has been recorded. Uh, so it will mean that uh, the link will be sent out to all the attendees and then will be put on the Turner Page website uh, so that both those who could attend this evening and those who couldn't and people that only found out about it too late uh, will be all be able to, to uh, find a, a nice hour to, to sit and discover a bit about bookbinding as we are going to do this evening. Yay! So welcome to the third uh, online event from Turn the Page this year. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Turn the Page is usually a beautiful uh, celebration of all things book art that takes place in the atrium of the Forum building in Norwich. Uh, obviously, and for obvious reasons, that hasn't happened for the last two years. Uh, but this year, uh, the team behind Turn the Page, uh, which is Jules and myself and a number of other incredible book artists who have exhibited at the fair over the years, uh, decided that we would have an anthology celebration where every month was a celebration of one of the past years of Turn the Page because next year is the fair's 10 year anniversary. Uh, so woo, <laughs> woo for making it. 10 years. Uh, so we've had a few uh, different online talks and tonight's uh, is in a completely different form from the others, which is lovely, uh, where uh, Paul Garcia, uh, who is the, uh, I'm going to get this right, East Anglia Chair of the Society of Bookbinders, um, and a regular at Turner Page. So anybody who has been to the fair will, I am sure, have spent time uh, stopping and marvelling at the uh, beautiful creations happening right before your eyes where Paul bookbinds in the middle of the fair. It's joyous and quite hypnotic. Uh, and the Society has over the years uh, also exhibited some of the incredible pieces that they make. Uh, so we are really lucky this evening that Paul has been incredibly generous and has created us about a 40 minute long uh, film uh, with different snippets from his making of a book from beginning to end uh, and Paul is going to talk us through that and and sort of give us a bit of director's commentary uh, on his film and on the making of a book uh, and then there will be time at the end uh, for for questions and comments from everybody uh, so for now I would suggest uh, simply simply holding those questions and, and writing them down if you don't think you'll remember them uh, and making sure that you are all muted uh, so that we don't accidentally talk over Paul. So I am going to just have a little check and make sure that everybody other than Paul and myself, which they are, so that's fantastic. Um, and then I shall I don't know if I actually introduced myself. That's terrible, isn't it? I'm Rosie. <laughs> um, and I'm involved with running down the page. Uh, but it's not about me or anything other than a glorious uh, evening of books, which is what we're all here for. Uh, so I am going to hand over to Paul and we're going to hope that our practice earlier of sharing the screen wasn't like false confidence <laughs> and uh, let him share his screen with us. Okay, I'm going to click the share screen button and see what happens. Uh, okay. Um, so I think you can now see my screen. But you can't I can see, see your screen. We just need your lovely video. Yeah. That disappeared then. Ah, here it is. There we go. Um, Perfect. Is that? Is that? Can you see all of it now? We can indeed. Right. Okay. Right. Well. Thank you very much, Rosie, for that introduction. And um, thanks to, to Jules and Rosie for hosting the Society of Bookbinders uh, at Turn the Page for the last 10 years. And uh, thanks tonight, especially to Rosie and her sister, Queen, for setting up this Zoom meeting. Uh, usually at Turn the Page, um, I demonstrate a bit of foot block sewing and a bit of head banding. 
Um, uh, but because of the, the, the space constraints and the time available, I, I haven't felt able to show any of the other processes involved in actually sort of making a, a, a book in a fairly traditional sort of way. Um, but this now this Zoom format um, has allowed me to compress the, the week or so that it took me to construct this book. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is the book um, which you'll see being made. And um, I've compressed it into this a 40 minute video which comprises uh, several um, small clips. And what I'm, the plan is to uh, talk you through the clips as, uh, as, as it happens, as it unfolds, and uh, tell you what I'm doing and, and why. And uh, in one or two instances, pointing out something that went wrong, um, because uh, nothing always nothing goes to plan every time. So uh, without further ado then, I shall press play. Okay. And it should say folding, and there you are. Uh, this is me um, folding the sections. Um, I'm only going to show you folding one uh, for the single sheet of paper. Uh, there. <coughs> and uh, I folded 11 sections, um, 10 for the book block, and one that uh, makes up the end papers. And uh, we'll see the end papers being made a bit later on. Um, I actually find that it, it, the sound of making, uh, doing this folding and cutting quite hypnotic, really. Uh, <coughs> those, those little clicky sounds. Right now, second second clip here. Now I'm going to prick the holes for sewing in the uh, in the sections, and I'm using uh, an awl, which I uh, inherited from my father. And uh, a homemade pricking cradle, which is made out of some bits of mill board, a bit of uh, book cloth. And uh, so we just prick the holes and it's all ready for sewing. Um, some people prefer not to use a sewing cradle, but uh, I find it makes things a lot easier. Paul, not too uh, sorry to interrupt. Is there any other? sound on on your computer other than the video no because we're getting a little bit of feedback and everybody is muted so i'm not quite sure where it's coming from um, there's nothing that's no, absolutely silent okay well then we shall just have to accept that it's the one of the weirdnesses of technology uh, uh, anyway. please keep okay here we are i'm now, now making two stiff leaved end papers i think i'm only going to show you making one of them um so i've uh, got a, a bit of marbled paper there that you can see and uh, I'm sticking a, a folded plain sheet from the extra section that I folded onto that. Uh, and I'm using, um, uh, uh, this is a 50-50 PVA paste mixture. The paste is um, made from packing peanuts, um, which you get uh, when you buy stuff from various places. And uh, it, uh, with those little sort of tiny sausages, which are, are, are just pure starch. So if you just dissolve them in water, they make uh, a fabulously sticky paste, which lasts, if you make it up, it lasts about a week without having to put it in the fridge, which is uh, very good. And you only need makeup as much as you want. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm putting a little tiny strip of PVA uh, along the folded edge. And I'm going to stick on the, the, the black bit that you could see in the uh, corner of the screen there. That's going to be the hidden cloth hinge. So that's a, a, the little strip of glue is about sort of two, two or three millimeters deep. And then the, uh, the cloth hinge, which is a bit of uh, actually just black calico, but you can use any old book cloth or I have done it with aero linen as well, so you could use anything. Like that. You could do it with very thinly paired leather as well. And then we fold that over, and rub it down, and then the, the second white sheet, which you can see there, on the, on, it's on my left, I don't know what side it's on on your screen. 
Um, that's going to get stuck on as well. And uh, these, I like, I like making up these end paper assemblies because I can then sew it into the text block. So the, the, the end papers and the, uh, the text block are all sewn together and the sewing goes through that cloth hinge. So it makes for an incredibly strong structure. Probably, I mean, it's probably over-engineered, but I like it. So here we go, so we now stick that one in there. And rub that down a bit. <coughs> there we go. It's, uh, I had the camera sort of pointing straight down on this one, so it was easy to do. Now you fold the, the white sheet over. Right over the whole assembly. So you've now got the white sheet on top of the, uh, the hidden cloth hinge. And I mark that bit with an X because that bit is going to be on the outside. The other bit goes against the text block. <coughs> now we come to sew it all together. This is just uh, towards the end of the sewing. Um, the, the end papers, uh, sort of the first end paper is going to be sewn in at the bottom there. And this is one of the sections. And uh, Oh, I, I, you can hear that noise because it's playing the videos twice. Hold on a minute, I'm going to pause this. And yeah, for some reason, there's two copies of the video playing. Yeah. That will explain the extra noise then. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I'll do that. Next. Mm. I can't see because the. If you. If you... Simply just quit quick time and then we open it again. Yeah. Uh, we'll find our place, I'm sure. Video. I'll, I'll just stop the share for a minute. I'll stop the share. Right. That will explain where the Yeah. It's still it's still there's there's another copy of it playing in the background. But... Right. Sorry about that. Yeah. Try again. Oh, this is very weird. Why is it playing two copies? Very strange, but hopefully that will have solved it yeah. and we will no longer have. But I could suddenly hear it. I don't know why it was doing that. Okay. Well, I'm now screen sharing. Let's try playing it again. No, that's. Why is that not playing? Ah, oh, right. Now. Okay, can you still hear me? I can still hear you. Oh, good, right. So let's try pressing play and see if we get less. Right, let's try. Let's Go back a little bit, maybe, so that we... No. No, that's no good. There we go. Try pressing play and we'll see what we've got. I can't I can't find the play. Oh, there we go. Stop it. Move it forward a bit. Oh, too far. Oh, there we go. That's the sewing again, right. Okay. Right, okay. Here I am sewing. Right. <laughs> Wonderful. Hopefully that'll solve it for everybody. Yeah. Okay. Right, so um, I'm sewing it, and I, this, this, this particular text block, I'm sewing it on two tapes, and uh, I'm using a, a, a link stitch, sometimes called French link stitch, but uh, I don't think it's anything to do with the French. And here I'm just doing the kettle stitch at the end of a row. And That's tightening the kettle stitch and sort of settling it down. And that's when I stop. Now, this is this is where all that noise was coming from. This is uh, having sewn the text block. I think I'm then going to trim it using my um, Lue video, my like, Lue uh, vertical plow. Um, this is just uh, plowing the foreedge. The the, the the vertical plow is is, is a wonderful invention. Um, 
because I used to use an ordinary horizontal plow and uh, it was always really, really difficult to, um, to, to get the text block in, in the press and tightened up properly and, and get it lined up nicely. And because uh, you're always fighting gravity and with this vertical plow, there is no gravity doesn't come into it because you can just lay the block on the flat uh, base uh, and adjust it to the right place and it just stays there and it's wonderful. And um, I uh, wouldn't use anything. Well, I do occasionally I use a, a northern one, but mostly I use this one. And, uh, it's a lovely device, but it, do, it does make that, that strange noise that we've now managed to, to get rid of, um, and sort of click clacking backwards and forwards, that, that, that's quite hypnotic. And uh, the other advantage, of course, is that you can do it with one hand. So you can stand there and uh, sort of listen to the noise and gradually doze off. Ugh. The other advantage is, of course, you can stop at any time. So when the doorbell goes, um, that sort of thing, um, you can stop and you just come back to it and it's, it has, nothing has changed. It's wonderful. I really like it. Um, I won't show ploughing the head and tail, but uh, I, because uh, it takes quite a long time. But um, on this particular book, it was it's going to be a, a, a flat back, so there was no rounding involved. But because the thread was fairly thin and the paper was fairly thick, uh, it was possible to squash the text block so that uh, the spine edge and the fore edge were the same thickness so that while I was ploughing the, the head and tail, um, it didn't get twisted. Right, here we are. Uh, having finished all the ploughing, I'm now going to line the spine. Um, I'm going to line it with the uh, frame knot, which is a, a sort of cotton cloth. Um, lots of people use mole for this, which is much more open weave. But I, I prefer the, the fray knot. And uh, I'm, I'm just lining it with the fray knot in between the tapes to try and sort of help reduce the bulk over the, the, the sewing and the tapes. So this is just using uh, pure PVA. I'm just uh, lining it in three bits. I, I, was, I was very good this time. I, 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 pre-cut all the little pieces to stick on, especially for the video. Usually I do it one at a time. Uh, and it's a slightly less well-organized process. I'm just rubbing it down to make sure it gets. And then um, when I've stuck on the last bit of the uh, fray knot at the bottom, I'm going to line the center section with some craft paper. Um, Eventually, I, I, I will line the, the head and tail ends with craft paper, but I'm not doing that straight away because the next thing will be uh, sewing the headbands. And I like to sew them through the fray knot because it provides a bit of extra support for the headband. Um, but you don't want to do it through the paper, so the paper goes on after the headband. So this is a bit of last bit of fray knot going on and then the, uh, the the three little yellow bits are the craft paper I used to use all the time I used to just collect wrapping paper which is essentially craft paper uh, and use that but it was always brown <coughs> excuse me and I, I I got fed up with using brown paper on all the spines so uh, I bought some colored craft paper that they sell for uh, well, it was in a catalogue an online catalog for supplies for primary schools. So I don't uh, quite know what they do with craft paper in primary schools, but uh, yeah, so I'm putting, I'm putting three layers on because I found that three layers of ordinary craft paper like this almost approximates the thickness of the thread and the tape. So um, and with the frame knot, so it comes out more or less level. Um, there, there will, I mean, the tapes will, uh, so it might still show through the spine, and they, they, well, they don't actually on this one in the end, but sometimes it does, depends on what you put on the back. 
Okay, so that's the last bit of uh, craft paper going on. And then the next thing will be the head banding. I think this is the, the head banding is the longest section. So, uh, what is it here? So I've, I've started off the headband, uh, which was cheating a bit. I didn't video the uh, the starting it off because that's always a bit fiddly, and uh, that's that's the one time where it all might go pear shaped. So uh, we, we almost certainly will go pear shaped when you start off. So I didn't video that. I got started properly, and I'm using a, a leather core, which is actually the, the the leather thong that they sell. That you can buy in craft shops for. Uh, putting beads on because uh, it comes in you can get it in one millimeter or two millimeters diameter this is a two millimeter bit and um, it, it's very consistent thickness all the way through I know uh, lots of people cut little rectangular bits of uh, leather to use for headbands and I, I always found that I, I can't get them even so one end is always slightly narrower than the other but using this stuff they always come out a consistent diameter, uh, if you're pleasing, and uh, so true. So uh, I'm tying down using the red thread, uh, not the green thread. So the, the green thread is just wound around the core, but the, the, the red thread, every time I start the red section of red thread, it gets tied down. So you get one, then there's one complete loop after the tie down. And then you lay it over and wind the, 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 the green thread over the top to lock in place. So that it looks like, so the appearance is of three turns of each color. Um, so then there's, that's one complete turn, two complete turns of green, and then uh, lay it over and turn and wrap the uh, the red thread with the needle on it over the top to lock the green thread in place. Um, <coughs> so there we are. So now uh, the next the next red one will be tied down as well. And I think this is this is you know, that's tied over now. This was really difficult to film because I had to have the camera between me and the, the 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 work. So I was sort of reaching over the camera to try and do it, um, and trying desperately not to joggle the camera too much. And uh, also, what is really weird is that I don't know if you can see the little notice. It says "Keep calm and carry on binding," which is back to front. Uh, the camera has reversed everything left to right. I'm actually left-handed. I'm not doing this with my right hand. So uh, to me, this looks really peculiar. <laughs> it, the opposite direction to the one I went in. So that's one of the joys. And this, this is also a point where... Uh, I'm going to make a mistake in a minute. Uh, not this one. I think this must be the next one. So it got into a bit of a tangle. You'll see that in a minute. And uh, that, that's the point at which I shall stop. Uh, uh, you, could you could also use ready-made headbands. There's nothing wrong with that. But uh, I just prefer... Well, I, I actually enjoy doing this. There's lots of people say they hate headbanding, but... Uh, along with sewing the text block and sewing the headband, so it's like my two favourite parts of the whole process. <laughs> yeah. I must have, when I first started bookbinding, I only ever used the stick-on ones, and, uh, and I was really desperate to learn how to do this. And it took a lot of practice to get confident. My, the, the first headbands I did were complete shambles. But the, the good thing is, if you don't like what the result is, you can just cut it off and start again. Mm. Uh. <clears throat> so yeah, this is it. See, I've got a tangle. I've, I've, I've put the needle through the loop by mistake. And, uh, yeah. 
or you know, I think the oh dear, <laughs> I've got into a muddle, so I'll stop. Okay, now, um, having done both the headbands, what I'm doing is I'm using the, the waste sheet, that's the, the, the part of the uh, end paper with the X that I wrote the X on. I'm now going to make that into a, into a tongue or flange that is going to go between the boards because it, it's a sort of double board construction. And uh, so the, I'm going to, the, the, the tapes and the frame knot are now glued into this, into this fold like that. So this makes the, that, that's going to be the board attachment. So one board, you'll see that uh, coming up shortly. Um, one board gets attached to the inside of the tongue, one board gets attached to the outside. And uh, I've done one side. The, 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 that funny sheet of stuff that I put in between is a bit of bondina, which is to stop um, the, the, the glue bit sticking because sometimes you get strike through. Um, and uh, I know, can you see these ridiculous mail messages that are coming up as well? Um, I don't know how to stop them. So anyway, here's the second second flange. Pin down the tapes. This is, this is again. This is using the mixture. Sometimes I do it with PVA, but I happen to have the, the mixture to hand, and it's much easier and quicker to do with the roller. Um, since I discovered these little rollers, I was told about them by Mark Cochran. Um, I think they're wonderful. Much, uh, <clears throat> get much even, much more even spread of glue than when you're trying to do it with a brush. So there we are. So the, 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 that, that gets nipped in a press overnight until it's nice and dry. Um, and then I'm going to trim a bit off. So I'm trimming 20 millimeters off uh, either end of the tongue. That's to allow for the turning when you put the covering material on. Um, so, just trim, trim those bits off. And then snip the, uh, <coughs> snip that bit off using my cranked vine scissors. Because you can get right, because it's cranked, you can get the blades really close to the to the edge of the spiny. Okay, that's it. Now I'm going to attach the inner board. Um, these are two bits of mill board which I've cut over size. Um, I always cut the boards slightly too big and then trim them down afterwards uh, because that way you can get the text block, you can get the square nice and square to the text block. So just hold it in position. Bit of mixture on there. Uh, rub it down. And, uh, I, always, I always mark on the on the flange how big the bits of how big the book is, and then add the, the squares, and then add a little bit extra. For good luck, so that I know how big the bits of millboard have got to be. Uh, each piece of millboard has been uh, chamfered at the, the spine edge. So on, on the inner boards like this, the chamfer goes downwards towards the text block. This is to allow room for the hinge to happen. Because um, I'm not using, I'm not putting a groove in on this at all. So, uh, the, 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 and then stick that down, and then then I'm going to infill. So the next the next bit, I'll get ahead of myself now. Um, okay, so the next bit is infilling because the, the 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 there's a bit of thickness to that flange. And uh, so I don't want it to, there to be a sort of lump or a shadow where the flange is. So I've cut a piece of uh, manila, which is the same thickness as the flange. 
and that gets stuck on to compensate for the gap. So it's now all the same level. So in fact, there's three layers to the board. There's the inner board, there's the flange and infill, and then in a second or two, the outer board will go on. So rub it down where, where the joins are, where the two materials meet, make sure you rub it down firmly. And then you can see you can see on that outer board now, you can see the flange just under my hand there. Um, glue out the, the entire thing. And then stick that board on. And line it up nicely. And then when that's happened, um, that would then go in the press for a, for a nip and probably to stay in the press overnight until the glue is properly dry. And now, now I'm going to trim, trim the boards to match this, the text block so that the square is nice and even. So I'm using this little bit of brass channel, which I got from a, a hobby shop that sells parts to people who make model, model railways um, and this is an eighth inch square which is about three millimeters so i make two little marks i press it up against the text block mark near the outer edges and then when i get the ruler the right way up I get it right into the spine yeah uh, and then trim off the excess And that means that the the square is, is going to be even all the way around. So it, uh, it's I find it much easier than trying to cut the boards exactly to the right size and cut them square um, before you attach them, because that's really difficult. <laughs> and uh, I have over the last few years, I've developed all these ways of um, working that make it much easier um, for me so that I don't have to do too much measuring and squaring up. Um, there we go, so that's the, the it's always slight, slightly awkward doing it in this direction. And once again I had I, I had the camera sort of between me and the work. So it was, So that's that bit come off, and then the last, lastly, we'll do the, the four edge. So we'll press it up against the four edge. A couple of marks with the knife. I use a, the the knife to make the marks rather than a pencil because you get a much more accurate position. Because the pencil has a particular thickness, even, even if you've got a, a fine point on it. And then you can you can sometimes get it skewed with you if you go from one side of one mark to the other side of the other mark. So this, this way you get it straight. And don't try and cut through it all, all at once, stroke it through. Right? So that's that's trimmed that. Uh, now I'm going to build the hollow. I'm going to, I, although it's going to be a flat back, um, I'm still going to put a, an Oxford hollow, as they call it, <coughs> on the back um, to hold the, 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 the card spine piece. Because uh, it's easier to get it in the right place then. And I always make the hollow on the book. Lots of people make them off the book. Uh, once again, that, that requires a degree of precision that uh, I find difficult to achieve. So, uh, so that's the first bit of the hollow. So I've got the, the, the flap uh, I'm holding out of the way while I rub it down firmly. Uh, and then fold it to the other edge of the spine. That way it's always the right width for the spine because you don't want it, if, if you make it too wide, then you end up with a sort of baggy hollow, uh, which is not desirable. And uh, if you make it too narrow, then it won't do the job properly. So uh, now I'm gonna put some glue. This is, this is just PVA I'm using because it dries more quickly. 
TVA uh, all over that. And then back the other bit down. And, uh, <coughs> then you've got the fold, the, the, the spare bit, now gets folded over. Uh, I've never found a way of doing this without getting PVA on your fingers because you have to hold the inner flap so that it doesn't ride up out of the way or sometimes it goes curly and gets in the way. So the idea is to keep it nice and flat, so rub it down and then find the edge and sharpen it up and then um, what I'll do, I'll leave that to leave that to dry, uh, and when it's completely dry, I then trim off the excess. So that that excess bit, that excess flap there, yeah, that gets trimmed off, um, and then trim to fit the book. And now um, I've got. You can see there's a spine piece. I've put, put a bit of card on the spine as well. And now I'm going to commence the covering for this. Um, the first stage of the covering is using a, a page from an old book. Uh, and uh, so I'm just covering that and gluing that out in the mixture. And that's going to go over it because um, the, the, the theme of the covering was going to be letters. So I thought it would be interesting to have some text visible through the gaps that are going to appear in the, the rest of the covering. So that's uh, that is coming. It goes over the spine as well. Uh, in this case, Just try and get it in neatly to the into the spine. So over the uh, the chamfer on the board there. <coughs> and rub the rub the spine into place there. That over. And then going to do the corners next. So trim the corners, and uh, because it's a paper covering, um, and, I, and, I, and you only need a tiny bit of overlap. Um, I, I'm just doing this by eye, so I'm just snipping off 45 degrees at each corner and leaving a, a couple of millimetres spare just to go over the corner and then turn in the, the head and tail first. Uh, the, re the reason for doing the head and tail first is because when you, you make this, um, as you'll see in a minute with the fold, you make that little push that little bit in, that's going to make a tiny little lump. When I fold the foredge in, that's going to make a tiny little lump. Well, if you did the foredge first, that tiny little lump would be on the, on the tail end and it would rub on the bookshelf and eventually wear away. So that's why you do the head and tail first and then the foredge. So that little tiny lump. Uh, I mean, there are ways of doing it to avoid the lump. This is a fairly straightforward way of doing it. And that's flipping the forage over. And uh, then we're getting, getting perilously near, just sort of rounding the corners a little bit because you don't want them to come out too sharp. Um, that was one of the, the early things I learned in book binding that sharp corners are not desirable. Okay, this is now finishing the covering. I've done most of it using these leather. Um, strips that I cut letters out of using a die cutter for a, for a different project. And I had all these thinly paired, I pared it down to about three millimeters thick, um, no, 0.3 of a millimeter thick, rather, I should say. Um, and I had them all left over, these little colorful strips with the letter cutouts, and I couldn't bear to waste them. So uh, I decided to make a book and just use them to cover it. So I'm just rubbing it down with a bit of Bondina. Is, uh, so it won't stick. And then turn it over the forage. <coughs> Rub it down a bit. And then so 
you know, and then rub it down at the, uh, the settle it into the spine. So you lift it a bit and sort of push it into the joint. And then that's called setting the joint. So you open the, the, the cover horizontally and sort of push it towards the text block just to sort of stretch the leather into the joint um, so that it, it knows where it's supposed to go. And then uh, this is the, the last bit, just checking, checking that it fits the space. Always a good idea to check that it's going to fit before you apply the, the adhesive. And a bit more paste. Well, actually, I think I, I, it was, it's mixture I was using here because it would dry a bit quicker. And because the, uh, the leather was very thin, I didn't need to have lots of paste to soak into it. There we go. Set that down in the right place. Rub it down again. The the head and tail you'll notice don't have cutouts. I used uh, bits that um, thin bits of leather for the head and tail that hadn't had uh, letters cut out of them because I. I didn't think that would uh, turn over too well over the, the edges of the board at the top and the bottom of the head and the tail. So there are, so settle it into the joint and then uh, just set the joint for a little push and there it is. Right, so that's, that's the covering, that's the, 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 the covering complete and uh, we're nearly at the end of this. Um, so now what we have to do is uh, trim out the, uh, the inside because the, 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 the you can see the covering material is a bit uneven after you've turned it in. So I'm going to trim that out so it's the same, so it's nice and even the way around, and uh, fill it in with a bit of Manila so that it's uh, all the same level. So that the idea is when you put the end paper down. There's a, a nice sort of flat surface, and you don't get to, you don't see uh, where the turnings are. So this is after the glue is dried, obviously. And so you just have to sort of peel it off. It usually comes away reasonably easily. You have to poke at it a bit sometimes. Like this. The leather, the leather came off more easily than the paper because, as I say, that uh, the, the mixture. That you make with that paste made from the packing peanuts is fantastically sticky. Um, certainly stickier than any of the wheat starch paste I've ever made. Let's finish that off. Mm -hmm. Just sort of prise it up and peel it off. Sometimes, sometimes it takes a little bit of the board away, but that doesn't matter. It all going to get it's all gets covered up. Slip it away from the spiral. <laughs> that was a slight fight just at this particular juncture, but it, it did it gave in in the end. There are, and it's come off. Right. Okay. Uh, so the next thing to do is, is put down the hinge. So that's the, the, the bit of cloth that was built into the into the end paper. So that's the, the hidden hinge. So that gets covered up as well. So that goes down first. Just PVA this time. A bit, a bit liberal with the PVA there, I think. Because it's cloth, it tends to soak in a bit. Nice. And st stretch it over the, the joint. And, uh, uh, settle it into the settle it into the joint, or rub it in because it's, it's it's going over the uh, the chamfering there as well. Rub it down. <clears throat> So it sits very neatly into the, into the joint there. And then 
um, filling in here. This is just a, a bit of manila that I've cut to fit that space. And uh, the, these, these boards, because the, the leather was very thin, so I wasn't exerting any stretch on it. I didn't need to put any draw sheets in to flatten the boards. Sometimes, sometimes you do, but in this case I didn't. So the, uh, that just fits in there. It covers up, it covers up the hinge. And in fact, before, before I stick the end paper down, I did, uh, when, it was, when it's dry, I sand the junctions where the, that paper meets the, uh, the, the leather. And also over the sand, it just a little bit over where the cloth hinges, just to reduce the bulk a bit. Uh, so that when the end paper goes down, <coughs> it goes down over a nice smooth surface. So, so I put it um, put it under a weight, uh, leave it propped open, and let it dry. Uh, let the hinge dry open. Um, and now we're going to put down the end paper. So just uh, put in some mixture there in the end paper. Get a nice even coat. Make sure it goes right to the edges because you don't want it to curl up. It's really awkward trying to get glue under the edges. So take the, put the waste out and then sort of stretch it gently. This wasn't very stretchy paper, so it didn't get too didn't stretch very far in its natural length. And just smooth that out. Because uh, it's a, a, a proper marble paper, I was rubbing it down through, uh, through the bondina so that I didn't smudge the, uh, the uh, let the glue smudge or anything. Some, some, sometimes, Ordinary, ordinary marble paper will smudge if you rub it too hard. And uh, then settle it into the hinge, but don't go, don't press, I didn't press too hard because you don't want to tear the paper because it is wet with glue and it's much weaker at that point. And make sure it's rubbed down well into the corners and at the edges. And then again, put the board, leaving it open, let it dry. In the open position. And there you are, this is the finished book. Uh, it's sort of back to front. Because <laughs> the camera's reversed it. There you are. And it was nice paper, it was some paper I got from the Frogmore paper mill when we went on a visit, and it's got Sort of inclusions of bits of grass, I think, in it. It's machine made, it's not handmade paper, but it's very nice anyway. And uh, there you are, that's it. That's, <coughs> that's the end of the thing. So I shall stop sharing my screen now. See what happens. Oh, right. That's wonderful. Right. So, anyone got any questions? That was wonderful, Paul. Thank you so much. Um, yes, indeed. As Peter, as Peter did, a big round of, round of, <laughs> round of virtual <laughs> muted applause. Oh, um, that's gorgeous <laughs> and oh, utterly okay. hypnotic. I don't know about everybody else, but I could happily sit and watch videos of book binding yeah. <laughs> for hours. <laughs> People just folding paper would do me. It's yeah. gorgeous. Um, so we now have time for four questions. Um, so what I'm going to try and do is is monitor the um the chat where people are putting uh we have some nice comments that was amazingly complex you must have the patience of a saint um, and an excellent thank you so if anyone wants to write uh questions or comments in the chat they can people saying uh, that was very informative thank you um fascinating to watch the process uh and then if anybody would like to either just unmute themselves and ask a question or or sometimes there's a you know a way of raising a yeah. virtual hand uh and i shall i shall see if we can field any questions okay. uh, so we have someone here saying great presentation can you explain how you did the die cut uh for this you know before they were scraps indeed yes um the, 
it, it, it just uses a machine. Um, it, a, a Sizzix uh, big shot die cutter, which you can get quite easily from hobby shops and uh, Amazon and all sorts. Um, and they sell, I mean, it's, it's mainly for people who do paper crafting, or people who like to make um, birthday cards and Christmas cards and that sort of thing. Um, and you can get all sorts of ready-made flat dies. They're very thin. And uh, I've got uh, several alphabets. Uh, it's, if you want to do onlaid letters in leather on a book, it's really hard to cut them out nicely. Whereas if you buy a, a ready-made die, you can, you can pair the leather very thin using your um, Felsted Skyver or your Brockman or your Sharfix, or whatever you happen to have lying about. Um, so if you pair it very thin, it will go through the, 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 the die cutter very easily. And uh, the, the, one of the main advantages is you don't have to then pair the edges of your onlay because the die cutter automatically turns the edge over. So you get a really neat finish on it. Um, so I'd, I'd cut out all those letters to use for another project um, that, that Jules knows about. And, uh, and, and I just had the, 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 those, the, the, the spaces. Sometimes the negative space is just as interesting as the thing you cut out. Um, so uh, I, made, I made use of it. And that's, uh, that's beautiful. And very well, I like the... I like the the page of a book behind it. So we have letters on letters. I think that's very Yeah, nice. yes. yes uh, so someone was asking what thickness of board you used. Uh, it's one millimetre uh, mill board. Um, so uh, I mean, it's nominally one millimetre. It usually comes out and I measure it at about 1.1. 1 .1. Uh, so there are two layers of that, plus the thickness of the, uh, the manila. Uh, compensate for the flange. So the whole board in the end is about 2.3 millimeters thick. Nice. Um, which is, I, I mean, I like a chunky book. I mean, I know there, there are people who prefer very thin boards. And um, so I, so the, 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 the one millimeter mill board is, is really easy to manage. Oh, someone, John, John is saying, how do you cut thick mill board? Um, you don't. Um, you buy a thin mill board and cut pieces and then stick them together if you want a thick bit. Um, if, you, if you bought two or three millimeter um, uh, mill board, it would be impossible to cut. You cut it with a saw. Some people cut it with a saw uh, and then trim it to size afterwards. You cut it to approximate size. Otherwise, if you've got room, you can buy an enormous board shear. Um, but they, they weigh about 700 kilos and the blade is um, a metre long. You need quite the bookbinding studio for that yeah, one. Yeah, if, if you're in my tiny cellar, which is um, uh, three feet wide and, and, and seven feet long, uh, and the, the working space I have, you, see, you saw my pink um, uh, cutting mat, uh, that, that is essentially my entire working space. Uh, so... Uh, no, no room for a board shop, I'm afraid. Um, so we have a few more questions. So the first one is um, interesting to see you using a roller, uh, which I enjoyed as well. Do you find it uses more PVA than with a brush and does it take longer? No, it, it uses um, less PVA, I think. Uh, and it's actually much quicker because you can cover a much wider area very fast and you get a much more even coat. And is it easy to clean up again afterwards? Uh, yeah, you just run it under the tap. P PVA, because it's um, I, PVA, I think that's M1218 from Hewitt's, I think. Um, it's all reversible, you see. So you just run it under the tap yeah. uh, and, it, and, and, and it disappears. Uh, wonderful. Or, or if, you, if, you, if you don't, if you leave it to dry, if you leave the PVA to dry, it turns into a sort of flexible plastic layer and you can just peel it off world's most satisfying it's action <laughs> it's, quite, it's quite fun if you if you put pva on a on a glass plate and leave it to dry and then you can <laughs> like have this lovely sort of flexible semi-transparent sheet of pva um so then we've got someone uh, with a lovely comment which i'm going to read because it's beautiful and i agree with them uh saying thank you your hands in that video tell an even deeper story from confident surgical precision to balletic delicacy of knowing 
which is oh, a blimey. very nice sentence. I like that. <laughs> well, it was just me trying not to be ham fisted. That was <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you can take the compliment, Paul. Um, and then uh, Jules asking what thread you used for the headband. Uh, which is a very nice question. I've got to say, I've never seen anyone stitch a headband before. I'm still on the using the ready-made ones bit. Yeah. So that uh, was it's, amazing. Um, it's uh, the, the Guterman silk thread um, that is sold. That comes from that. That, that stuff is from Hewitt's. Uh, you can get it from other places. Uh, I have got a, a selection that I bought from other sources as well. Mm. Um, but it's a, a nice sort of diameter. Um, because you, it's thin enough to make a nice headband, but not so thin it takes you a week to wind the headband. I've got some a huge roll of green and red silk that I got from um, one of the silk mills in Sudbury, and uh, it is so fine that, that that headband would have taken hours to do had I used that. So. Thank you. I I want a glimpse at all your your things, your your beautiful rolls of silk and your boxes full of packing peanuts ready to make glue. I like I like the sound of all of this. Well, um, if you have a proper turn the page uh, in person next year, I usually do yeah. a headbanding box so you can look at it. Yes. <laughs> a headbanding box sounds beautiful. Another thing to add to our fair list. Yes, yeah. please. Um, someone's asked what is the name of the uh, groovy scissors that you were using? Uh, they're cranked vine scissors. Um, Hewitt's used to sell them, but they can't get them anymore. But if you look on Amazon, sometimes you can get them. Um, they are they are quite expensive. Um, that that pair was twenty six pounds, I think. Good pair of scissors. They are, but uh, they're well worth it because you can get right up close mm. to things without your fingers getting in the way. I've got. Um, lots of, it's surprising how many different kinds of scissors you need. I've got those for various things and I've got a, another pair that I bought at um, the last SOB conference which have got a sort of extra handle you can put your whole fingers in because that gives you extra leverage for snipping through your um, your leather core if you need to and then I, there's a nice black pair that I bought just because they were black. <laughs> no such thing as one tool for everything. Yeah. This is I think people look at artists and think we're just being silly when we have large collections of whatever oh, yeah. tool it is whether we're using for whichever art we're. It's like, yeah. no, no, they're all necessary. Every single one of these beautiful things that we bought because we like them is actually essential. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Paul has very uh, generously put together a materials list and a equipment list uh, for what he was using while he was making the video. And when I send out the link uh, for the recording for everybody to watch, I will include uh, those two lists uh, so that anybody who uh, wishes they had all the wonderful uh, tools that Paul has at his disposal can at least know what they are so they can set out to find them. Um, and on that note, uh, someone in Canada has asked... Canada? Uh, yes, yeah, someone in Canada is with us this yeah. evening, has asked, what would you suggest they use if they don't have your amazing plow tool? Equipment can be hard to obtain in Canada, apparently. Yeah, well, there are well, there, there are lots of ways of, of trimming a text block. Um, the, the easiest and way to do it that uses the least equipment is if you've got a press, um, you, you get the book, clamp the book really tight in the right place in the press, and then just use a chisel, a very sharp woodworker's chisel, and you you, you, you need to press it down flat on the cheek of the, uh, the, the press and you just slide it backwards and forwards. If you've got a, 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 chisel, a, a chisel with a curved end, that makes it a little bit easier, but you can do a, use it with a flat end chisel as well. Uh, and just slide it backwards and forwards and do it slowly. The thing about uh, trimming is that you can't do it quickly. It's not a fast process. Um, so if you're going to do it, you've got to be prepared to put the time in. Um, otherwise, you've got to spend thousands buying an enormous electric guillotine. <laughs> uh, they had one of those at Campbell College of Art where I studied my MA. I miss it. Yeah. It was lovely. <laughs> it was in the letterpress, which was in the basement. And I oh. suspect the only reason that Campbellwell still had a letterpress was that there weren't enough experts to know how to take the giant pieces of equipment mm. out of the building. 
because the doors weren't big enough. So somebody would have had to know how to take them apart. <laughs> so it gets to keep its letterpress because there's nothing else that can go in that room because they can't get the beautiful presses out. Thank God. Let's see. Oh, it's a... So we have here um, somebody that clicked in late and they're asking about the glue that you sometimes use instead of PVA, which is a very good question because it's handmade and it's fascinating. So yeah, tell well, it. it's um, the, 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 it's a mixture of 50% uh, PVA and 50% paste approximately you know I mean you sort of ladle out a couple of tablespoons of PVA and a couple of tablespoons of paste I mean not scientifically accurate um, but the paste uh, is made from, from these these are packing peanuts I, I, I don't know what they, they probably have other names in other places but uh, it's a sort of squishy the squishy packing stuff that you get uh, when you buy stuff so there's another one um, they come in these little sausages and they are pure starch and all you have to do is take a, 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 some cold water uh, and sort of squish them in and stir them around preferably with a little tiny whisk um, until they dissolve and then you just keep bunging them in about uh, I suppose a teacup full of water might take seven or eight handfuls easily because they go to practically nothing um, and uh, when it feels thick enough, uh, you can sort of stop. And then I usually leave it um, overnight. So if I know I'm going to need some fresh stuff in the morning, I would make it last thing at night. And uh, leave it overnight just to settle down and then give it a st another stir in the morning. I also put two drops of clove oil into it because it tends to go a bit frothy. And if you put a couple of drops of clove oil in, it gets rid of the froth and it also smells nice. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, and uh, I got the clove oil from Boots. And the, Boots the chemist, though. And, That's amazing. Uh, and, and it's really, really sticky and uh, it will last about a week without you having to put it in the fridge. Green stuff. And it's really cheap because you've already paid for the goods. That you've got, and this stuff comes with it for free. Yeah, that's and, that's way better than buying buying. Oh stuff yeah, to make your glue yeah. with. Yeah, love it. So all I would say is, if you're trying that and it doesn't work, it's because you're getting the ones that are still made of polystyrene, and polystyrene yeah, they, they, they won't dissolve. Break down into <laughs> yeah, they, they just won't dissolve. They'll, they'll, <laughs> no, so don't be too frustrated. You're like, why isn't this working, Paul? It's just because you got the wrong kind. Wait for another delivery and see if that works. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so we have someone here asking, can I ask how you deal with the pull between starch, PVA and the different materials like leather and paper? It's something they've always struggled with and they end up with the boards turning upwards. Well, what, what I always do is, um, first of all, cover, I mean, if you use double boards with, the, um, with the, the, the manila in between, like I did in that one, then you tend to get less curl because you've got um, a layer, two layers of glue and a layer of something else in between the two layers of board. Um, then always put the covering on first, so your, your leather cover, fix that on first, and then let it dry thoroughly under a light weight. You don't, you don't want to crush leather in a press too hard, so just a you know, uh, pressing board on it, and then that usually is enough to hold it down. Let it dry thoroughly. So when I say thoroughly, leave it two, three days. Um, and then take, take the, the pressure off it and leave it for another day or two to see what happens. Now, uh, usually what happens then is they start to curl outwards. If it then curls outwards, what you do is on the inside of the board, uh, you put what is known as a draw sheet, which is a, th a sheet of very thin uh, paper, usually uh, 45 or 50 gram paper. It used to be called bank paper, but banks don't use paper anymore. So you can still buy it in, in art shops. It's called layout paper. Uh, and for, you've got to make sure you get the grain in the right direction. So you want the grain up and down, you know, parallel to the spine. Um, you paste that with just pure paste, so it's wet. Okay, so you paste that, and when you put it, the, the, the paste will make it stretch, and you stick that and stretch it across the board. Um, 
and then let it dry thoroughly. And usually one piece of that, um, I, I, I've, I've got a demonstration piece that I made for something else a while ago, that, but it's downstairs. Um, and usually one sheet of that will be sufficient to counteract the pull and the board will go nice and flat again. If the board doesn't go flat, whack on another draw sheet. And, uh, that usually does it. Uh, only once did I have to use three draw sheets because it was a particularly intransigent bit of leather. <laughs> um, but uh, that, that usually does the trick. And then, then you can then you, uh, put my lining in if you want and, uh, and then put the end papers down and that hold it nice and flat. But, always, and, but make sure you sort of dry it under a light pressure and let it dry thoroughly. Very often people uh, mess about with it when it's not dry, when it's still a bit damp. Because they, they, if you put in lots of mixture and paste on the, those boards, the boards will get damp. And uh, you want it to be dry before you do the next operation. Uh, so the person whose question that was says, thank you so much, truly grateful. So you've clearly solved an well, like ongoing issue to the, this <laughs> evening, which is fantastic. Yeah, thank you all so much for listening. Uh, how was, how yeah. long, how much time did you condense into 40 minutes? How long did that book actually take you to make? Well, it was about a week of making the book. Um, and I, I only recorded uh, what I thought might be the, the most interesting bits. I mean, and, and not all of it. So I think not it, the drying it, process for two not, the, not, not while it's sitting in the <laughs> um, So someone asks, uh, what was the thickness of the manila and of the craft you used for the hollow? Well, the the, the craft paper is whatever craft paper comes at. Uh, it's usually, I think, about 0.2 of a millimetre. Uh, and manila is twice the thickness of craft. So if you haven't got any manila, all you've got to do is glue two bits of craft together and you've got them. Um, and, and in fact, I mean, I have a, another project I've just finished. Or, and I'll, doing another cup. I, I made a book entirely out of brown wrapping paper. Yes, I saw that online. So you can stick four, 14 layers of uh, brown wrapping paper, make a nice board about 1.4, 1.5 millimetres thick. You do have the patience of a sage. <laughs> our, our commenters are <laughs> correct. It's <laughs> the way of being retired, you see. You I get to I experiment with these things. Uh, so do we have any other questions or shall we shall we thank Paul and wrap it up there? I think probably I need a loo break. So, <laughs> well, OK, so I will say on behalf of everyone, uh, thank you so much, Paul. That was beautiful. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I know everybody else did as well. There's lots of lovely comments coming in about how much people enjoyed watching that. Um, and I truly hope, as I'm sure does Jules, that Turner Page will be back where it belongs, in person, in the, the under the, let's say, sun. Let's imagine Norwich sun, under the sun in the atrium. <laughs> so that those that have access to it can come and watch you yeah. do your thing. Yes, yeah. well, that, that would be nice. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm, I'm convinced <laughs> it will happen. Uh, so uh, for now, I shall say good night to everybody. Um, I shall hang on here while everyone leaves in case anybody uh, needs to ask me a question. Um, and I shall uh, send you the link uh, for the recording probably at the start of next week, once it's all rendered and, and I've got it online. So thank you very much, Paul. Big round of applause. Uh, a huge thank you for everybody who came to spend their Friday night with us uh, watching that beautiful video. And we hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs> oh, we have someone from Finland, oh, Finland Canada, this is amazing and, and some people from Norwich, awesome <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, right, I'm going to remember to stop our recording yeah. so there we go